Hello, and it's uh, lovely to be here in a room of what I assume are insect lovers. As uh, Brett was explaining, I started off, uh, we bought a cottage called Beehive Cottage, and we were given a present of a beehive, and that started my long uh, journey with bees. I ended up having an anaphylactic reaction, so I had to stop beekeeping. Um, but it happens to a lot of beekeepers, actually. But now I've got much more interested, uh, as well as honeybees, but in lots of other bees and insects, as the bee bees have become a sort of gateway drug to this wonderful world. So um, it's great to see you all here and to um, celebrate the exhibition, which explores the way that animals have been depicted in art across uh, the past 2,000 years. So I think they're interesting papyrus and so on. And tonight we've got a panel of experts who can explain lots of different dimensions um, to all of this. So let me begin with George McGavin, who's a, a renowned entomologist, explorer and passionate uh, conservation advocate. You probably know him as a television presenter as well. He was an academic zoologist for many years before presenting many programmes, author of lots of books. The latest one is called The Hidden World, How Insects Sustain Life on Earth Today and will shape our lives uh, tomorrow. Um, his research has taken him from the tropical forests of Papua New Guinea to the caves of Thailand. And this is something I'm rather jealous of. You have several insect species named in your honour. Oh, yes. There's yet to be a bee, Martha, uh, all of which he hopes will survive him. Mm. Sitting just next to George is Levon Biss, who's a... British photographer, widely considered to be one of the leading macro photographers of his generation, and his artworks are held in lots of public and private collections. The photographs are created from over 10,000 individual images, and you're going to have a real treat later on because I'm going to be showing them some, uh, some of them up on the screen. And as well as the most beautiful photographs, the detail is extraordinary. I've never seen uh, anything like it. And then just next to me here is Karen Wimhurst, who's um, a composer, widely commissioned chamber works to musical theatre and large-scale collaborative productions. She's performed at the Bournemouth Symphonetta, the Grimthorpe Brass Band, Welsh National Opera, Scottish Chamber Orchestra, Electric Voice Orchestra, Allegri Quartet and Solid Strings, amongst many others. And she's also a passionate um, activist from the environment, um, which is wonderful to hear, and enjoys working across disciplines with entomologists. Um, also supports the uh, environmental charity Common Ground, the National Trust, and many others. So thank you all. Give me lots to talk to you about. Um, and we're going to kick off with a performance by Karen. But before she begins, I'll give you a clue about what this um, next piece is about by getting George to describe to us Exactly what is a bog bush cricket? Well, a bog bush cricket is a cricket, and the males, as they all do, sing. Uh, and you shouldn't confuse grasshoppers and crickets, because grasshoppers have got short antennae, crickets have got long antennae, and they sing in different ways. So a grasshopper will use his, um, a row of pegs on its hind leg on the edge of the wing, like this, whereas crickets use their front wings, which have pegs and a row of, uh, and a scraper, and they, they move the wings like this very fast, and it can produce a mechanical noise. And the one that you're going to play, I haven't heard this, so I'm very excited, because it is quite a sort of fast zzz, zzz, zzz noise. It does and go I'm, pretty fast. I'm not yeah. quite sure how you're going to do this, but... <laughs> I'm working my tongue. Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, take it away. Here's Karen with the bog bush cricket, which I have to say is one of the most eccentric introductions I have ever done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
As George said, we were there in the book. I just love that. <laughs> that was it was great. so playful and yeah. brought us back into the meadow. It was just wonderful. <laughs> and I have to ask, how on earth did you get the idea for that? Um, well, it's part of a series called Jump. And they were sort of lockdown pieces, really. So it came about when well, lockdown happened. And we were all, I mean, as musicians, you're pretty much stuffed, really, sort of sitting at home. So... And a bit later on, I went down to my local river where I swim, the River Stour, and there was this profusion of grasshoppers, you know, everywhere. And so I guess it's at that time when people were talking about dolphins going down the Venetian canals and this kind of thing, and um, uh, deer appearing in towns. And for me, it was these grasshoppers. And um, it took me back to childhood and just that sound, such a lo lovely sound. So anyway... Um, I'd spent time working with an entomologist, Peter Smithers. I'd written a, a sort of small chamber opera to do with Darwin in the Barnacle and then Miriam Rothschild, who looked at fleas. So I was quite interested in these little creatures anyway. So I phoned him up and said, have you got some recordings? I thought this, I could do a solo piece because it's only me. I'm going to layer myself. I'm going to play, you know, play it all. And so it started off that way. That's so interesting. And it's very interesting what you say as well about lockdown which as we all know is terrible for for many many reasons but also did lead to for a lot of people a new appreci appreciation of the nature that's close to us because we were looking at things with a particular intensity and you were listening with a particular intensity yeah absolutely it was an amazing sight and it also it just gave you the feeling that with a tiny little bit of space things regenerate and, and I guess the, the sort of title of the piece, Jump, you know, if we move, we can actually move fast when we want to and change things. Yeah, so. And Livon, did it take you back to childhood, listening to that? It is, it is. I grew up in Surrey, and I remember trying to find sort of crickets and stuff in the, in the long grass, um, you know, for years, years when I was a little kid. You know, you're, you're just like trying to find out where, where exactly in the long grass they were, and you try and catch them, and obviously you fail miserably every time but <laughs> I spent many a wasted hour doing that well, not maybe not wasted is it 
I think that's because they have sort of superpowers of throwing their sound about or something, don't they, George? Is that it can be difficult to, to pinpoint exactly where they are because as soon as you move, they stop singing. Mm. So you, you, you do have to be very careful and have a very big net. <laughs> uh -oh. That's where I was going wrong then. I just, yeah, big, uh, net. Excuse my big net. But it's funny, isn't it? There seem to be some insects <coughs> that were more drawn to than others. And there is, as I was saying, the, the playfulness mm. of the cricket. And I guess people know Jiminy Cricket from cartoons and so on. There is something that draws us to those particular insects. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, absolutely. And I am constantly amazed at why more people are not entranced by insects. Uh, there, there are far more people who simply don't want anything to do with them. I mean, they, if they're in the garden, fair enough, I suppose, but certainly not on the house. I mean, they, they don't want anything in the house. Uh, but during lockdown, I was, I was in two minds about it. Yes, it was very nice that people were going out and looking at the natural world, but unfortunately, they were now looking at the natural world in the same places that I was looking, and there were a lot more people. <laughs> so it was sort of, hey, what, what are you doing here? Oh, I'm looking at the, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> I think if, if, if people understood insects more, then they, they, they'd that, appreciate yeah. them more. You know, so I've been, I've been photographing insects only for maybe 12 years or so. So I, I'm only halfway through my career, or you know, the previous 12, 13 years, I had nothing to do with insects, and, and really I was probably one of those others who didn't really appreciate them. Mm. It's only since I've been working with them and sort of on a daily basis to understand how ingenious they are, how beautiful they are. Then, so, you know, so I've gained the knowledge and now I love them. Mm. And I think that's, we, we, we're brought up and grown up, we grow up seeing insects as pests, not, not as insects, as pests. And no, that, and, and, that's, that's and that's how people seem to perceive them. And, and that's why it's so interesting, this kind of collaboration, mm. with, I mean, with, between insects and the world of art and the world of music as mm. well. It's a very rich territory, isn't it, in terms of creativity? Yeah, it is. And, um, you know, in playing these pieces, each piece is quite discreet. And I talk about, well, you know, the insects themselves, about stridulation and how they make these really kind of great you know, rhythm sections don't have to carry about equipment, you know, <laughs> from a musician's point of view. But um, I, I just think that it's just a way of engaging people, that sort of little bit of knowledge. And, and then, um, well, for me, the sound is just amazing. It's so sort of vibrant and full of life. Yeah, and it was great the way you incorporated the sound into your performance. Is, does it feel like a duet for you with the insects? Yeah, it does. Well, it feels like a sort of built-in rhythm section, you know. It just pulses away and... Um, well, I was reading David Rothenberg, who's another musician who's worked quite a lot with music, you know, just talking about, um, you know, these are the primary kind of, yeah, sort of rhythmic, you know, we love rhythm. But, of course, we've grown up as a species living, uh, uh, you know, living with insects right from the, well, the Jurassic period. So maybe, the, maybe they gave us it. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think of that theory, George? And, and yet we drown them out in yeah. our gardens. I mean, it seems to me that gardening is now uh, an occupation that involves burning fossil fuels in a machine that makes noise. So, you know, the, the, in the old days when I grew up, you would, you would rake the leaves with a nice rake, get a gentle noise. You know. Now it's a leaf blower, of course, and you, you cut your lawn with a, a, a noisy machine. I mean, everything's noisy. If you've got a lawn, some people have plastic yeah, well, lawns. Oh, don't plastic, oh, my goodness. Plastic lawns. I remember when I was a kid, I saw a cartoon in a very old magazine called Punch. I must have been about 10. And there was, it was uh, the family of the future. And the, the father was out hoovering an artificial lawn. <laughs> and so it has come to pass. And you, you can actually now, to, to make your lawn, your artificial lawn, look really good, you can now, you can now uh, smear it with uh, artificial scent so that it smells like, like a cut lawn. <coughs> and you shampoo it. There was somebody in Kent whose artificial lawn was being spoilt by the flowers from a tree outside her garden, shedding the flowers on her lawn. And she wanted the council to cut the tree down because it was <laughs> ruining her artificial lawn. I mean, what was wrong I mean, with that? I mean, that's on one extreme, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> but do you think that there has been a change in the sense that, you know, we've had no mo May 
and there is a greater appreciation of wildlife gardening and particularly because of people beginning to appreciate insect life more? Well, I think it's be because we really are realising that things are, are not in a good way. Uh, and anybody who's my age, as has been observed many times, will remember driving a car when you were a kid and the front of your car was covered in insects. This doesn't happen anymore. It, doesn't, it hasn't happened for some time. Uh, and the reason is that there are far fewer flying insects around year on year. But it happens so slowly that year on year is a little drop and it's not noticeable, it's not obvious. And then the next year, little drop. Every year is the new normal. And it's only when you get to 10 or 20 or 30 years that suddenly you think, hang on a minute, they, where are the insects? Uh, and this year has been particularly bad. We had a very cold winter. We had a very wet April. And early in the spring, I was seeing very few insects. I do a walk around where I live every week. And I just look at what's around and the insects were really down. I was hoping they would spring back, but now we're, we're approaching the end of June. Solstice has passed, and I'm still seeing not many insects. Mm -hmm. Far fewer bumblebees, far fewer hoverflies, far fewer everything. And I, I'm now getting quite alarmed. Actually. I know, and I've heard this from a number of naturalists around the country oh. as well. In fact, we featured it on the Today programme because I was picking it up from lots of people at your Twitter. <laughs> sorry. Next time, George, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> but particularly saying, given it's been such a brilliant spring for like hawthorn blossom, yeah. why isn't that full of... Uh, bear. Uh, it was yeah, bear. Yeah. yeah. But let's, you know, let's be the passionate advocate that, that you are for, for insects. And, I mean, I think you are preaching to the converted here. But why should people care about insects? Why do they matter so well, much? Quite simply, insects have been around on Earth for 400 million years. They were among the first animals on land. They were certainly the first in the air. And the whole of the... And they invented of, rhythm, according to Carl. And, and, and they invented <laughs> rhythm. They invented <laughs> rhythm. They made a rhythm, of course, absolutely. And, and the, the, the whole of the ecology of the Earth is based on animals with six legs. I mean, they are... The biomass of them is, is huge. They are the major carnivores, the major herbivores. They pollinate 80% or more of all the flowering plants with, and a lot of what we eat, of course. They are the major recyclers. Um, and one thing that they always forget, of course, is that insects are the food of the world. Most higher animals eat insects. So all the blue tits in the UK this year are going to be eating Billions of insects, billions. That's just one species of bird. All the bats eat insects. And, of course, this is going to have a, a decline in insects will have an immediate effect on the breeding success of birds, of bats, of other things. And we now know 40 years down the line that uh, things are not, not good, that things are really not, not well at all. And yet we are still strimming verges. We are still flaying hedges to destruction. We are still cutting ivy out of trees. We are still poisoning the land with billions of pounds worth of pesticides. And it can only end in one way, and it's not going to be good. And is that something that you hope through your music, through your art, is the message you're able to get across to people, Carl? Yeah, definitely. That's part of that's part of the piece. I mean, no, part of it is just getting absorbed in these little sounds like you do as a composer and riffing off them and developing them but jump is really yeah the message of jump is uh is one uh, uh, if we don't move fast you know if we move fast maybe we can create change but that is really necessary because actually the piece starts off with um well it starts off with a a, a piece uh, a reassembled sound of a cricket already extinct <laughs> which um when I first performed this, Charlie Woodrow, who works in Lincoln University, they have a bioacoustics lab, and they manufactured this sound from a fossil. They kind of reconstructed, yeah, they reconstructed yeah. the, you know, what the sound, what the body would have been like, and then they manufactured the sound of this cricket. So the first piece is called "Sound the Alarm," and kind of starts off with an, an uh, extinction sound. Um, and, and also uh, slowed down sounds of other crickets, which are singing so high. Uh, oh, you probably, I've forgotten the name of this critic, but it's a, it's a sort of a supersonic love song which we would never be able to hear. But if you slow it down, you can. And, um, you know, and these are things we can't perceive, and hence 
somehow they don't value these small voices. They're just disappearing, draining away into silence or man-made noise. Mm. And on this question of extinction or rare species, when you decide to go on an expedition, George, what's the basis for it? Is, is it to try and track down insects that may not have been seen before or that people are worried about? Or? Well, well I, I was very fortunate in that when, when I left Oxford, when I realised that what I'd been doing... 25 years was preaching to the converted, uh, I decided that, you know, per perhaps I should get a larger audience. So at that time, the BBC wanted to do expeditions in jungles because they, they are the real biodiversity hotspots of our planet. So they only cover now less than 6% of the land service area. Just hold that thought. And yet they contain between 50 and 75% of all species in, in terrestrial That's habitat. rainforest, is it? Yeah. 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 So it's a tiny area which has all this biodiversity, you know, <laughs> mainly insects, of course. And so we, we decided to do some expeditions in the field, filmed as live, as real, and just explore them. Uh, we, we didn't have any plan. They were unscripted. Uh, we just went into the jungle for six weeks with a big crew and just saw what we could find, uh, which was always remarkable. And always unscripted? There were always kind unscripted. of ones, you know, here's a beautiful yeah. butterfly I prepared yeah. earlier. No, no, no. No. <laughs> no, audiences are very smart nowadays. They, they know how programmes are made. And you can tell if it's genuine. You can tell if my reaction to seeing something is manufactured. If, if, I've, if it's genuinely something I've seen there and then, you know, I can't fake it. So, in, in fact, it's, it's a bit awkward for the crew because I, I get very <laughs> animated in jungles. I run going, look at this, look at this, oh, my God. <laughs> and they go, George, just calm down, calm down. Look. And, and, in fact, what, what they would often do, if they saw some amazing insect in a tree or in a bush, they, they'd say, right, George, sit down, stay there, put a bag over his head, for goodness sake. <laughs> and, and then they would get the camera angles right and the lights, and then they'd say, OK, George, come forward, come on, come on. <laughs> So I was sort of wondering about, I knew there was something ahead and then I would see what it was and I would go, oh my goodness, look at this. Uh, which you can't make that up. It has to be filmed for real the first time. No, I absolutely agree with that. I made a, a documentary um, uh, about the migration of the painted lady butterfly, which mm. migrates from the Sahara Desert over the Atlas Mountains. And as George and the others will know, um, some of them, these pioneer butterflies, make it all the way to Britain mm. um, in one go. So it was a great thing. We began, we were filming, it was very, very hot in, in uh, Morocco. I was with an entomologist. And the crew had bought me a butterfly net because they, they, this was the shot they wanted. Mm. And I suddenly went, yeah, I think it's a painted, butter a painted lady. And nobody quite believed me understandably because I'm not an expert but it really was one so they were they weren't quite ready so no. the footage is me looking ridiculous like trying to get it with an incredibly jerky footage but it was real which is what yeah. they, they absolutely wanted and had they said to you right uh, Martha can we just do that again yes <laughs> you, you'd have felt <laughs> a bit so, oh no I wouldn't actually I wouldn't do it yeah I wouldn't do it exactly it would never <laughs> never quite have worked mm. but it was yeah it was a very kind of funny bit of uh, the footage and actually a wonderful way wonderful introduction to because I'd known about the monarch butterfly which you may know about in, in Mexico and I've seen that as well but I hadn't realized that closer to home it's the longest migration I think of any any butterfly and, and I wanted to ask you, Levin, I mean, how did you first get interested in insects? You said it wasn't that long ago, 10 yeah, years it was, ago, is it? It actually came through my boy. My son, when he was maybe about eight years old, he brought in a little ground beetle from the back garden. And um, the previous Christmas, we brought him a science kit for Christmas, you know, just basic stuff. And we looked at this beetle under the, under the microscope, and I was, just, I was just blown away by what I saw. Like I said, like, I hadn't really investigated insects before, and so... So it excited me, and so I decided... I mean, at that time, I was trying to look for a different sort of path in my photography. I've been doing a lot of portraiture and a lot of commercial work and documentary. So I was looking for a new avenue anyway. And so I decided to try, as a, as a technical challenge, first of all, to try and photograph that beetle for him as a present. Little did I know it, it would take me a year to work out how to do it properly. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I did it, and, uh, and I enjoyed it so much that, uh, you know... I tried again on a different specimen, different, and then 
Um, well, we're going to come and we're, I'm going to yeah. hold you there for a second because we're going to look at more detail in your photographs mm. in just a minute. But I wanted to bring in about your enthusiasm. And how about you, George? When did you first become interested? Really, I, when I was a kid in Edinburgh, growing up in Edinburgh, I, I, I was always fascinated by the natural world. That was, for me, that's the only event there is. Uh, that's the only show on earth. Um, history, art, music, that's all fine. But, you know, <laughs> great, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the natural world is what it's all about. So, so I, I ended up doing a degree at Edinburgh in zo zoology. And it was in my second year when we went to the west coast of Scotland uh, for a field course. And all my classmates were looking for badgers and owls and eagles and, you know, not finding them because large animals are quite rare, not very easy to work on. And yet at our feet were literally tens of thousands of wood ants doing what seemed to me pretty remarkable things. Mm -hmm. And I, I realised then that actually you do, this is what you should understand. And in fact, you can't call yourself a zoologist if you don't understand insects, because insects make up more than three quarters of all animal species. So you're not much of a zoologist if you can't tell a beetle from a bug <laughs> or a bear. Or a, well, we, or a cricket <laughs> from a grasshopper, or which we can all yeah. now do, yeah. is remembering so that, the beginning of your what, talk. The, the world, I mean, to a first order a estimate, most animals on Earth, every animal on Earth, has six legs. That's, that's the, the first order approximate of what, what we have on Earth. Lots of bugs. And tell me about one of your adventures, one of your expeditions, and the insects that you're most proud of finding. Well, there's, uh, <laughs> I'm proud of finding them all, but I, I do sometimes get carried away. Uh, so we were, we were filming in Guyana, and we found a, a, an army ant uh, colony, and they move the whole time. But in the evening, they often form a big ball in a nest, uh, in a hollow tree or something. And I thought, wow, this is great, we found one. And at the centre of that is the queen. You know, so let, let's get a camera a probe camera and stick it right down the middle of this nest. Yeah. So I'm a complete idiot, you know, sort of sticking it down. <laughs> Not realising, of course, that the probe camera is now uh, the M3 or M4 for the ants to come <laughs> rampaging up onto my bare hands and thence yeah. all over me. So I'm so yeah. fascinated by the camera image. Look at this, this is, and suddenly I realise, oh, <laughs> I've got... 50, 100 soldier army ants biting my so did they bite? Oh. into my feet and, and I ran off into the jungle yeah. going, ah, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, great. But it made a, a great piece of TV. And the other one that people love yeah. is me and the hollow log. The, this is, everybody thinks the TV company made me go in the hollow log. No, it was completely the opposite. They said, George, you're not going in the hollow log hunting for bugs. Yeah. It's too dangerous. You might die. <laughs> And I said, well, I'm going, so you can film it or not. And, and I went, <laughs> oh, get a camera. Yeah. And it was fantastic. And I found lots of fantastic things in this 100-foot-long hollow log. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just awe-inspiring. Not everybody wants to do it, of course. And they say, why did you do it? And I said, well, I do it. So you don't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, exactly. I'll, be, I'll let you do the ants. I'll do the pretty butterflies. You can do the biting ants. Um, well, as we were saying at the outset, the exhibition looks at, looks at science, music and art. And you've given us a sense, and even when you first began getting interested in insects through your uh, little boy, and was through looking at the microscope, you began to realise the amazing, minute world of the insect. Well, that's it. You know, it's only when you sort of really study them up, them up close, you realise... So I always look at them as like engineering mar marvels, really. You know, I think f from a distance, you can't get all that information. As soon as you see them up through a microscope, you understand how clever they actually are. And, um, and also visually, insects, for a photographer, it gives me so much to play with. There's so many different textures, opacities, shapes, colours. And as a photographer, you know, you're always looking for something that you can sculpt light around and you can enhance certain bits and this and that. And so they give you everything, or give me everything I ever need, subject matter-wise. Um, and also, you know, because they're so small, every time I work on a new spe specimen, um, I'm seeing something new for the first time. I mean, I'm, 
uh, I don't know if, you, if you, you know, you must have come across new insects and species that you never see before. Oh, yeah. And every time you see it, you, yeah. it's, you get a new thrill and there's me. Uh, absolutely. When I look at a new insect under a microscope, I'm seeing kind of a new palette for me to play with. There's something new for me to play with light and produce an image that also, you know, I never quite know how the final image is going to end up, um, which, is, which is the fun bit. And I'm hoping we might be able to see a very famous image of an insect behind us. Yes, so this is part of the exhibition. So this is uh, Robert Hooke's Micrographia, and that's just uh, amazing, isn't it? Well, I, I'm, I'm always amazed at how he saw what he did with the optics he had. In 1655. Yeah, yeah. That, I, mean, that that, famous, that, I mean, that's incredible with what he, he had at... Mm. You know, Have you seen the microscope that he did it of as yeah. well? How be uh, yeah, I mean, as a, as a side point, it, really the microscope was beautiful as well. <laughs> it was <laughs> beautiful, it? like leather, yeah. um, red thing. But crude in, in, in its optics. And yeah, yeah. And, and but also, you know, I was, I was saying earlier that I did... Um, I've, I photographed some insects in amber recently, and I've got... It's a long-going project, and I found a specimen uh, in Baltic amber, and there's a flea perfectly positioned just like this. And I thought it'd be a beautiful thing to sort of photograph that, you know, it's like 40 million year old insect. But um, unfortunately, the, the specimen was like 17 and a half thousand pounds, and I haven't really got that spare to, <laughs> <laughs> to, to buy to photograph. Oh, so sure, they'd lend it to you to if photograph. You could have a whip round yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be a little pot on the way out. Um, well, if you could just show us some of your photographs now, and um, yeah, yeah. on the laptop, I think, if you've got there. Go. Yeah, let's have a look. Um, so these are from, um, so you're talking about in COVID times, uh, you were uh, required, well for me I was a bit the opposite, because um, I started a project just before uh, COVID kicked in, and it's called Extinct and Endangered, so this is on at the American Museum of Natural History at the moment in New York, it's been there for a year. So I spent the whole of COVID six days a week, ten hours a day in my studio, photographing oh. insects. It across here. Yeah. Use the mouse; it's easier. Wow. So, um, so obviously, all the specimens I shoot are, are dead. They're historic specimens. Some of them, you know, we've shot some of Wallace's specimens, Darwin's specimens, everything. And you know, the reason I need my insects dead is because they take about four weeks each to, to, to create these images. So these images here, they're made from a, about ten thousand separate shots each. Um, I quite like this guy here. Uh, yeah. And so basically, they're, they're shot on microscope lenses on a, on a bespoke uh, rig that I built. It's, it's kind of basically, I built a kind of a microscope that is good for one thing, one thing only, and that's than this. And it's, qu it's quite crude. It's made out of cable ties and bits of wood, my, my system. I actually did a, I did a talk at a, uh, a scientific company who make microscopes. I won't say which company, but they, uh, the following week, they sent me a microscope that's worth like 200 grand and it took a week to set up and uh, I played around in it for a few days and I couldn't get any pictures remotely near <laughs> the quality of my own wooden <laughs> cable tie and gaffer tape system. Heath <laughs> Robinson lives. Yeah, it was an awkward Hello. phone conversation afterwards, I have to say. <laughs> so yeah, so this, this whole project here, obviously it's about insect decline and biodiversity loss um, and we're trying to highlight no, particularly specimens like this, where we're kind of all familiar with it. And it sh so the exhibitions that I have, these images here are printed big, about three metres tall. And it's nice to see people see, you know, the nine spotted lady beetle here and be shocked and slightly jarred and ask questions, well, why am I seeing this? Well, you know, and that by, by getting that reaction, you're then able to open up a dialogue. So, so generally, I, I kind of look at my images as being um, educational tools first and foremost. I mean, they they are artworks, and people buy them for their walls, and that's great, it's fine. But they're also used in school curriculums now all over the world, and I find that far more rewarding. Um, I'll leave you this one here. So it's beautiful. And again, this is what I was saying about, you know, things like wings. You can see I have an opacity. It gives me a, a chance to play with light, and uh, bring out different textures and structures and, and everything like that. Wow. So you can, this is a, a website called extinctandendangered.com and uh, it's got all the images there. It's got videos, it's got information about how we can protect insects and do your own thing and 
it's worth a little view. Um, it's good fun. Absolutely wow. uh, amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I'd just like to get you to, because you explained to me beforehand, but to explain in a little bit more detail about all the images that you used. You, you talked about yeah. them as stacking them on top of each other. So I, I use a, uh, a photographic process called photo stacking. You know, that's been around for a while. I, you know, I didn't invent it or anything like that. And, you know, George, you'll know about photo I've used stacking. It myself, yeah. But um, it's only really has, has become really useful in, in, since digital photography has come around. You couldn't, do, I mean, each one of these is like 10,000 images. You know, you try and do that on film. A, it's going to cost a lot. B, it's going to take a lifetime to do one picture. So, um, so basically, photo stacking, what it is, is so when you shoot in high magnification photography, there's very, very little in focus. This is called a shallow depth of field. I kind of always try and explain it by, if you close one eye and look at one particular subject, I'm looking at the top of this bottle, everything in the background is out of focus and everything, everything in the foreground is out of focus. So I've got one tiny slither of focus. And it's kind of what I do is I, I've got a, my camera's on a rig that's on a rail that I can automate. And then on the end of that, I've got microscope lenses. And uh, I set the camera to move forward in seven micron increments. So if you think a hair on your head is about 75 microns wide. Good Lord. Um, yeah, and so the camera will move forward seven microns, take a picture, move forward seven microns, take a picture, and so on. And, and, that's, and so say from, from the back of a fly to, to the front, that's about 500 shots of a, a, just a normal blowfly. But then what I'll do is I'll separate that insect into about 25 or 30 different sections and photograph them separately. So I'll, I'll, if there's an eye, for example, now an eye is dome-shaped, it's slightly reflective, and so I'll use a lighting style to make that one particular area look as beautiful as possible. But if I go to a wing that might be sort of semi-opaque, I'll change the lighting style to bring out the features in that. And so if you think, you know, so here to here is 500 images and you times that by 30 and you can see how the, the number of shots stack up. And so basically when you've got a stack of shots, you then just squish them together, take out the focus points, and then, you know, after four weeks you get images like that. <laughs> Aren't they amazing, don't you think? Incredible. Beautiful. <laughs> but it, so. but it, it, it's something that you could never see yourself. No. Not in a million years. You could study an insect at a plant or with, with a hand lens even, and you wouldn't yeah. even get close to what you're, you're seeing here. No, I, I don't know what the actual magnification would be. So if I'm using a ten times magnified uh, uh, 10 times objective, but then I'm, you know, you've got 30 different sections. Mm. I mean, I'm not a mathematician yet. You know, it goes way, way up. I don't know what the actual full magnification. I mean, each one of these files here digitally uh, is, is probably in the region of about eight to nine gigabytes. Each? Eight to nine. Each image? Yeah, each image, yeah. yeah. Um, so I print them three meters at my exhibitions, but that's only because I can only find printers that can fit. <laughs> and I can only, there's only so many venues can... But so if the, we would have, we have to go to America to see them that size. Yeah, yeah but yeah. they'll be over here, and we've shown them at Oxford as well. Yeah, we did. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. In fact, I photographed one of George's yeah. specimens once. Yeah. A branch-backed uh, tree hopper. A tree hopper? From Belize. Oh, yeah, that, that was amazing. Cause it's, uh, I spent two weeks in the jungles of Belize with an artist who was drawing them and painting them. And they're very hard to find, actually. They're really hard. You, you have to get your eye in. And so three days, you find nothing. And then suddenly you get your eye, and then suddenly you see tree hoppers everywhere, you know, and there's some really small ones. Yeah, yeah. And you did the one with the big curb on it. Yeah, and I'm pleased to say I returned it to Oxford intact. Intact. Because, you know, dry, museum specimens are very fragile. Yeah. I remember when I first started doing it at Oxford, and uh, an ex-colleague of George's, uh, Dr. James Hogan, lent me a first specimen just to play around with. And he said, look, and this is from a, a drawer. I remember it's called, it's called the dross drawer. <laughs> It's and it's, it's all there. there, there, they're just, you know. Anyway, so I was still wanted to hand it back intact. He said, look, if, it, if you break a leg or if you break a head or something like that, just bring me back the parts and we'll glue it back together. I was all right, fine. And so anyway, I put it on the, it was on a pin and I put it on some putty and I kind of twanged it with my finger. <laughs> and the head of this fly flew to the other end of the yeah. studio. <laughs> and I spent, and I, I got really nervous because I really wanted to work with Oxford. Yeah. And I thought, oh, I'll uh, blow my it. chance. I've I spent, done it. Yeah. I spent the next two hours on my hands and knees in my studio trying to find this head. <laughs> and, anyway, I can beat yeah. that. Yeah. Because I, uh, one of the worst days of my career at Oxford was transferring a Charles Darwin specimen from an old store box into a new drawer. Simple task, you might think, yes. 
But no, the pin had got stuck onto the cork of the old box, and you, you have to pull it vertically, otherwise it's going to ping, isn't it? Because the, the pin's going to go ping, and, and I, I didn't pull it quite straight, and it went ping. <laughs> and this Darwin specimen just, it was like an Ikea flat pack. <laughs> and it was all over the floor. Oh, I just, the sweat just jumped out my forehead. Oh, Charles Darwin. 17 <laughs> hours it took me to get, and I didn't get all of it. Uh, and, and I had to, I, I, in the end, I couldn't assemble it again. I had to just glue it all, all on a piece of card with the word, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing about this project, oh. extinct and endangered. You know, it was, I loved shooting the project, but the bit I hated the most was positioning the specimens because you you hold I've been loaned this specimen from the American Museum of Natural History in New York. They've got it all the way from New York to my studio in Wiltshire. Intact. You know, intact. Yes. And then I'm hand and then this is an extinct species. It's, you know, it's never going to fly on this earth again. And I'm thinking, yeah, don't mess this up. And I, I I'm, every morning I had to do this. I, I'd sit at breakfast and I'd have to psych myself up, just like <laughs> you know, to say by, like, by nine o'clock it's going to be over. It'll be there and you can start shooting it. Yeah. Well, oh. well, just a reminder, we're shortly going to be opening up to a, any of your questions. I'm sure that you'll have um, lots of them, given everything that we've been hearing about. But we're going to be getting the treat of another performance uh, from Karen. But as we did before, I'm going to get George to describe an insect called a mottled grasshopper. A mottled grasshopper? Yes. Lesser mottled grasshopper. A lesser... Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't want the greater one, <laughs> no, honestly. Great. No, that's terrible. <laughs> Well, of course, it's a grasshopper, so the male's going to be going <laughs> like this, pegs on the, on the femur, and they're going to be dragging it up and down the outside of the wing at various speeds. You, in, in the, it, it was worked out a while ago that you could actually tell how warm it was by timing the song of a cricket or, or a grasshopper, and, and if, if it was hotter, it would go faster, and you could actually work out from the speed of the song, how warm it was. Mm -hmm. So, This is a pretty chilled grass. This is a chilled, <laughs> okay, I'm glad. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is, because um, actually the piece, um, Jump, features insects and frogs. I sort of wanted to go up the food, you know, the, the chain, the hint of, of, of going up the food chain, really. Um, but, it, yeah, and so, th but this is, you know, a, a grasshopper. And um, it's really a bit of a sort of love song, really, in the sense that this sound seems to be the quintessential idea, in my mind, of a lovely, warm summer day. Um, but it kind of ends up, yeah, ends up somewhere else a bit anxious, I suppose. I don't know what happened at the end, but that's what happened. But I'll just actually make sure this beast is really working. <laughs>
it was really lovely and a very different tone. It was quite, you're right, I don't, it was something yeah, quite mournful, content. quite elegiac at the end of it. Lovely. OK, well, now it's um, your turn. And um, let's see if we've got any questions. But my experience in live events is there's normally a deathly silence. And then just when we have to wrap up, there are 20 hands in the air. Um, I don't know whether we've got... Oh, let's... The, how about the young gentleman at the front? Hello there. You with the Einstein shirt on. What would you like to ask? What's your name? My name is Saul. Saul. OK, hello, Saul. Look, we've got a red microphone for you. How about that? You. What would you like to ask? Well, I wanted to ask what the smallest insect is. Oh, well, I think that might be one for George, and that's a really uh, good question from the smallest yes. member of the audience. Um, <laughs> the smallest insect is very small, as you'd imagine. <laughs> uh, the smallest flying insect is, has a wingspan of about a quarter of a millimetre. So it's really tiny. That is really tiny. That's the wingspan. So the, the, these are wasps which parasitize, lay their own eggs in the eggs of other insects. So it, it, they are quite remarkable things. In fact, they don't really fly in the same way that normal insects fly because they are so small. Their wings are like little hair-fringed struts. They, they almost roll through the air because the air is so thick in comparison to them. Uh, they are very, very small, but you can find small insects <laughs> one millimetre fairly commonly. In fact, I, I found one the, the other day, it was about two, and I, I thought it was an ant at first, and I photographed it. It was a, a, a beetle, a very small beetle, from New Zealand, actually. It came in in, in the 80s, but anyway. So, yes, I mean, half a millimetre is probably the smallest, average, small thing. But, you know, insects range a fair way. I, I once thought I'd find the smallest insect in the world in a tree in Tanzania. And I was unfortunately with the Duke of Kent at the time. And I said, it, it was an RGS expedition. And I said, oh, look, sir, I think I found the world's smallest insect. Anyway, th this was overheard by a, a reporter. And when we got back to Oxford, there they were interviewed, there they were film people and TV crews and reporters outside the museum saying, where is it? Let's see it. Well, I couldn't find it. I mean, it was in a, <laughs> it was in a, a hundred tubes of alcohol that was somewhere that was in there. I said, well, I don't, I don't know where it is. And a, a, and a cartoon appeared in the press the next day of a bald-headed uh, scientist in a white coat, of course, holding up a flask. Where, where did he get this stuff from? saying, I found the world's smallest insect. Oh, dear, where is it? <laughs> <laughs> Said Dr McGavin, 87. <laughs> Great question, Saul. Thank you very much. And who else? Yes, this lady here. If you think we've got a microphone. Come in, fact, just, just behind you. There you go. <clears throat> so what is the biggest? <laughs> <laughs> You've started something. OK, so a, a Goliath beetle probably would fit on my hand. Insects respire, they, they exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide through a system of holes, little spiracles along the side, which branch into little hoover tubes. They get smaller and smaller and smaller. So oxygen has to diffuse from the outside right to the inside. So it's slower than if you have blood system. It has to diffuse. So if you're a big insect, the cells in the middle are not going to get their oxygen very easily. So insects tend to be, that's the maximum size for a beetle. If you're thin, you can get some insects which are about this long. So a stick insect, I think the biggest one's about 60 centimetres. OK, about that. Mm -hmm. So you can either be long and thin or, or short and fat. But of course, 300 <laughs> million years ago, when there was more oxygen in the atmosphere, up to 30% uh, oxygen, where as compared to only 21% now, insects could get bigger and were bigger. So you had insects with a wingspan of a metre nearly, and you got big, big, you know, giant things were fairly common. Just imagine the joy. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I'd be in heaven. We'd be ducking. Aside of that. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. Who's, yes, the gentleman in the front row. Both up properly 
very patient, and it's only like 40,000. It's a hell of a lot. And also stitching. I mean, have you, could you sort of give me a rough idea of a content view sometimes, how you might set something up? And How's I've got a rail, I've got some microscope objectives. It's yeah. the lighting and the diffusion and stuff like that. And if I could sort of jump up a few stages on and, and on, yeah, I mean, right on the back of your shoulders, as it were. No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, probably the, the I'm, I'm fortunate in the fact that, you know, I feel fortunate in the fact that I only came into sort of the insect world quite late on in my career, halfway through my career. So I had already had like 16, 17 years of commercial photography behind me, so I know light inside out. Yeah. And so what kind of makes my photography different from others is I can, I can just translate all that knowledge of almost like commercial lighting onto a subject that's five millimetres long. So I, I, I use strobe lights. And the, the light has to be fast. So my, my, the lights that I use, the light will be emitted and it will be gone within 20, 20 thousandths, thousandth of a second. All, uh, insects, so yeah, like flashlights, essentially. But the insects are not alive. Oh, no, no, no. no. Some, it's obvious because that number of them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, take, it takes, you know, sometimes four weeks to, to take one, to create one of these images. So I need... So the actual photography process can take up to two weeks. So I need that insect to stay dead still for two weeks. Um, so I will, I will generally work in two-week block, and I'll just shoot that day after day. The insect doesn't deteriorate in this time. No, no. I mean, so some of them are old, you know. So I've shot some of Darwin specimens that go back, you know, or Wallace, and you know, so, you know, a, a certain depending on the makeup, like butterflies, mm. pigment-based, you know, so they will fade after time. Um, a lot of beetles, they, I believe they make their colour through the refraction of light, don't they? Or they can do, yeah. So, you know, they won't fade. So once dried, essentially, they can last. If, if kept in decent conditions, they can last for a long, long time. Hundreds of years. I think, hang on, this seminar, I think, could go on for a little while. I'll let, I think, because there, there are quite a few other people. I'm going to, uh, maybe you could catch, maybe catch him afterwards. Did you, this lady here, wanted to ask a question? Thank you. Um, I was going to ask, Levon, from your photos, have you discovered anything new, like any of these parasitic insects or any features that have not been um, seen? Well, you know, everything's new to me. <laughs> That's the beauty of it, because I'm not an entomologist. Um, so every time I shoot something, I'm, you know, I'm, but it's, the things I find interesting, George will probably laugh at because they're just basic for him. Huh? You know, it was even things like, um, like the I, before I started shooting insects, I didn't know there were different types of hairs on insects. You know, it's, you know, there was on the tiger beetles, for example. It seemed to me like the the, the hairs on the legs—they almost like seemed to be hollow, mm. because when I, when I light them, when I photograph them, they they've got this annoying habit of like emanating the light, or, or sort of they act oh. like soft box. Yeah, they glow. Mm -hmm. um, or the, you know, on the, on the wings of, of flies, flying insects—they have almost like a Velcro-like little section, little uh, and hook, is that to yeah, hook, hook, the, yeah. hook the wings back. So, yeah. you know. It's, Everything is new to me, and uh, which is why, why I still, you know, I'm prepared to spend four weeks photographing one specimen. Um, whether my four weeks, but, but saying Dad, that, yeah, I'm in the studio. <laughs> saying that, I've, I've, got, I've had a lot of emails from entomologists all over the world that, that use the images and have, have found things that they haven't exactly, really, really that's known. That's the point. I've seen things on your images. I go. Ah, oh, that's how that works. Which, which for me is the most rewarding thing, yeah, yeah. knowing that, so, you know, they're, they're, they're not artworks, they're educational tools. And when I started getting emails from teachers all around, particularly in the US, they're in school curriculums all over the US, and I get these emails from the teachers showing that, you know, and they're learning them, because they, it ticks all the boxes. It's art class, it's biology class, science class, you know, and it's, it's good for children to be exposed to natural history. One of the things I see in your photographs a lot, particularly at the edges of plates where things move, is you often get lots of hairs that stick over the, over the joint. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's to keep dust and grit and muck getting between the two plates. So heads and obviously, where, where are they going to be doing yeah. that a lot? Often you find the, these fringes of really quite thick hairs and that must be there to prevent dust and grit and stuff yeah. getting in the in, yeah, yeah. in the gaps in the joints. Well, there's you, there is usually a, a lots of dust and grit in there. Yeah. So before I photograph a specimen, I'll probably spend two days cleaning it. Yeah. Beforehand, which you know is not underneath. Not <laughs> no, no, only no, 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 no. the top side. But um, but yeah, so you you 
even so on this project here, the uh, American Museum of Natural History, they even made this tiny microscopic hoover. <laughs> it's the cutest thing you've ever seen. So <laughs> sweet! And so they just be like hoovering specks of dust off the wings and stuff like that before they sent them over to me. Oh, that is true. Brilliant. That's perfectionism. Yeah, yeah. Now, we've also got people who are watching this um, online. It's being streamed. Are there any questions from them, Brett? Uh, yes, thank you. We've got a question here from Mabel, who asks, what's your favourite extinct insect, I guess, for the whole panel? Well, actually, yes, Karen, because you were talking about extinct insects earlier, weren't you? That is true. Well, on my track, it starts off with something called, I think it's called the Prophylangus obscura. And, uh, and so that's, well, that's my favourite one because I've worked with its sort of imagined sound, I guess, which is, yeah, so that is an extinct bogbush cricket. I think it went extinct in 1867. Yeah, apologies to Charlie if I got the name slightly wrong there, but I think that's what it is. How about you, George? I think we've got to accept that extinction is the norm on, on Earth. Um, and... One, only 1% one of all species that have ever lived are alive now. So That's an extinction is statistic. what happens. Yeah. Uh, and we're simply worried currently because we think it's happening a lot faster than it probably should happen. Uh, and the sad fact is that probably the majority of insect species on Earth will come and go without us ever knowing they were there. That, unfortunately, is, is the case. But a particular one that you'd... I couldn't, I couldn't pick one. It would be... <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Lee? Maybe not an extinct... I've, I'm, you know, but it's one that's almost extinct that I photographed for this. It's called the Lord Howe Island stick insect. Oh, yeah. mm. uh, and it's, a, I say, a nice story. It's a nice and not-so-nice story where they, they, they were native to a small outcrop just off Australia, and there was a shipwreck many, many years ago and the rats off the ship got onto the island and nibbled all the insects, killed them. Mm. And they were thought to be extinct for decades and decades and decades until a, a small mating pair was found on an outcrop, wasn't it? And then they, <laughs> they, uh, they were being reared now in San Diego Zoo, is where I got my specimen from. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's a positive story where, you know... And, and some of the specimens that I photograph are from breeding programmes, so they're not extinct, they still come under the, the subject matter, but it's not... The idea is not to be all doom and gloom. Well, I, I completely agree, and I always try on, on the day programme when I can to cover positive conservation stories to show that there is, a, amidst the apocalypse, that there is a glimmer of hope. In fact, on the programme this morning, we've um, talked about the large tortoiseshell butterfly, which is thought was thought to be extinct, is now appearing in nature reserves and places throughout southern England, which is, you know admittedly partly to do with climate change, but anyway, at least it's the sign that um, it's, it's, uh, a species can be brought back. And um, we're coming very close to it. We've, we've overrun a bit because we started late, but uh, time for one more question, if anybody's... Uh, am I missing somebody's...? No, OK, all right, well, that's very good. Then everybody's had the chance to ask any questions that they wanted. Thank you so much, Saul, for kicking us all up, getting everybody going. We found a lovely thing. And I want to say thank you very much indeed to my guests, to Corin, her wonderful playing, Levon uh, with his fantastic pictures, and George with all those really fascinating insect packs. Thank you all so much. <laughs> <laughs>